It's now my honor to introduce our guest this evening. I assume most of you are familiar with Leonard Pitts Jr. as a nationally syndicated Miami Herald columnist whose Pulitzer Prize winning essays about race, culture, and politics appear in the Phil Philadelphia Inquirer. But Mr. Pitts is also the author of a number of fiction and nonfiction books, including the best-selling Becoming Dad, Black Men and the Journey to Fatherhood, as well as the novels Freeman, which the Inquirer described as a myth of what hu what's humanly possible, a needed story about little-known heroism, and a shadow thrown forward to the struggles of American families in the 21st century. And the novel Before I Forget, a critically praised story of fatherhood, Alzheimer's, and how African American men confront illness and grief. Traversing time and touching on prominent themes in contemporary American race relations, Pitt's new novel, Grant Park, blends the narratives of Martin Luther King Jr.'s last day with a reporter's fight for the truth on the eve of President Obama's 2008 election. Critics have called the book a page turner, an important book that honestly examines the current tumultuous racial divide in our country. And my personal favorite, Grant Park boasts something few other thrillers can claim, journalists as action heroes. Talk about fantasy fulfillment. Please welcome Leonard Pitts, Jr. Um, to talk a little bit about Grant Park, um, Grant Park is a novel about race and disillusionment. <clears throat> it's a novel about the sense that I felt over the course of my life, and I think others have felt also, that we did not get where we thought we were going uh, at the end of the civil rights years when Dr. Martin Luther King pointed us toward the promised land. Uh, I know that I'm not the only one <clears throat> to uh, look up 40 years later, 40 years and then some later, and find myself stunned and disappointed by some of the ways in which we failed to reach where we said we were going. In other words, uh, you know, I find myself 40 years later having to defend the Voting Rights Act <laughs> and, and seeing it gutted by the, uh, by the United States Supreme Court. I'm appalled to find myself 40 years later, one, have that, that, we have, that we have a need for something like Black Lives Matter, and then that I have to explain to the likes of Chris Christie, the governor of your neighboring state, that it is not a terrorist organization. I find myself appalled 40 years later to have to be talking about things like mass incarceration and how it is functioning in much the same ways that Jim Crow functioned once upon a time. So there's a lot of things that we thought, many of us thought perhaps that we would not be dealing with uh, once upon a time that we find ourselves dealing with very much today, perhaps in different forms, perhaps with, under different names, but a lot of the same stuff going on. So I wanted to write a novel about people, uh, you know, who, who, who came of age, who fought those battles, and who thought that they had achieved a, 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 or, or taken the country to a better place, and then looking back you know, on, their, on, on those battles from the perch of 40 years later, and their disillusionment, their sense of, of, of unresolved, their sense of, of disappointment in the fact that the nation did not go to where they thought it would go. So there's two characters I want to tell you about briefly, and then as I said, I'll read you a little bit of an excerpt. But the story is basically told through the, through the lives of these two men, and uh, it's bookended, as you heard, by the uh, assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968 and the election of Barack Obama as the first African-American president of this country 40 years later in 2008. Uh, the first of those characters is a gentleman named Malcolm Toussaint, Malcolm Marcus Toussaint. Uh, he was not born Malcolm Marcus Toussaint. He was born Moselle Uriah Wilson, Jr., and if you were born Moselle Uriah Wilson Jr., you'd probably change your name too. <laughs> With apologies to any Moselles in the room, I don't, <laughs> don't want to get in any trouble. But uh, he changes his name to Malcolm Marcus Toussaint because he is a young African American, uh, con conceives of himself as a young Afri African American revolutionary of the late 1960s. And as a revolutionary, the name Moselle Uriah Wilson just isn't cutting it. So he changes his name to Malcolm Marcus Toussaint in honor of three revolutionaries, Malcolm for Malcolm X, Marcus for Marcus Garvey, Toussaint for the Haitian general Toussaint Leouverture. And we meet Malcolm uh, on his way home, coming home from uh, a, a prestigious college to which he had a full ride. He's a young African-American man, I think I said, and he's, he's a really bright kid, really gifted kid, had a full ride to this college, and he's been kicked out 
and the reason he's been kicked out, uh, if you ask him, he'll tell you, well, he was kicked out for protesting. If you press him, you'll, he will tell you, well, I was actually kicked out for writing bleep you, or bleep the system, rather, on the side of the administration building. Uh, and so he gets kicked out of school and he's sent back home to Memphis. And Memphis in that era, in uh, the spring of 1968, is a, is a city in turmoil. It's a city in tumult. Uh, it's a city that is undergoing, that is going through a strike by its sanitation workers, about 1,300 men, the vast majority of whom are African American, one of whom is, is Malcolm's father. And to understand it, I, I find that a lot of people don't really remember or have you know, only vague memories of what the sanitation worker strike was about, so just to digress for a moment. The sanitation workers, as I said, largely African American, were men who worked for, let's say, a low, on the low end of maybe 85 cents uh, an hour, uh, maybe on the high end, close to $2 an hour, and I know the young people in the crowd will hear that and they'll think, well, that sounds like not a lot of money, but in, in, 18, in 1968, you could probably buy a car for 85 cents an hour. No. <laughs> 85 cents an hour was a pittance even back then, and that's what these guys were working for. So they're working for very little money. They're working under unfair conditions where they might come in and actually spend 12 to 13 hours at work but only get paid for eight. They're working under supervisors who denigrate them as uh, boy and, and the N-word, et cetera, and et cetera, et cetera. They're working under unsafe conditions because the trucks uh, are very old and they are prone to, uh, to mechanical malfunction and they are working in unsanitary condition. Uh, in Philadelphia, as in most cities, I would assume, you put out your trash at, at the curb once or twice a week or whatever it is, and a truck comes by and picks it up. In Memphis at that era, uh, in, that, in that day, what happened was you'd put your trash in a metal tub in the back of your house, and it was the, the uh, sanitation worker's job to traipse through your backyard and get the tub. Now, there were no restrictions on what you could put in there, and because it was a metal tub, these things tended to, to, uh, to rust through and to leak in the rain. So, and I've interviewed the, the sanitation workers and they've told me, you know, so many stories about you take the metal tub and you've got to carry it like this and this sluice of, yeah, eggshells and cigarette butts and maggots and whatever else comes down on your head. They were so filthy, they used to call them walking vultures and they were so filthy that sometimes they were not even allowed to, uh, to take city buses home. Uh, they'd get on the bus and the bus driver would put them off and they would end up having to walk home. So, you know, they, they, one of the things they were striking for, frankly, was a place to clean off the muck. They wanted better working conditions. They wanted, um, they wanted more money. And the thing that sets the strike off is this day in February when two sanitation men, Robert Walker and Echo Cole, uh, get into the back of the truck, the drum of the truck, to um, escape from the rain. And as I said, the trucks are malfunctioning all the time. And the one truck, the, the, the hydraulic ram in the back of the truck starts up on its own with nobody pushing a button and these two men are crushed like you know literally like the garbage that they haul and for the sanitation men this is one this is enough this is for this is far more than enough and they head out on a wildcat strike uh, they want they want better conditions they want respect they want the union to uh, to you know to to uh, they want the city to to, to um, recognize their union and <coughs> this is also you know thinly veiled this is also a, 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 a it's a fight about economic justice and working conditions. It's also a fight about race. Because as I said, the vast majority of these men are African American and what they're feeling and what they eventually you know, end up carrying on a sign uh, to, uh, to speak to, they're feeling that as if they're not treated as men. And eventually they begin carrying a sign which some of you may remember, it's a very iconic sign that says, I am a man. Okay, so this is what Malcolm goes home, and, uh, goes home to. But Malcolm, as I said, is a very young man. He's a young man of the late 1960s, and as some of you who lived that era will, will perhaps attest, there were, there were actually kind of two 1960s. In the early 1960s, there was optimism and there was hope, and there was the answers, my friend, to blowing in the wind and keep on pushing. And about 67, 68, the 60s turned very angry. And it was not about answers, my friend, blowing in the wind. It's about a uh, ball of confusion. That's what the world is today. And so, you know, he is a young man of that latter 60s. He's a young man who does not have a whole lot of patience with the idea of we're going to link hands and we're going to march and we're going to sing We Shall Overcome and this is going to change things. He's a young man who does not have a whole lot of patience with the idea of I'm going to resist nonviolently. That is, I'm going to put my head down and I'm going to take the blows, but I'm not going to strike back and this is going to change things. He doesn't have a lot of patience with the idea of um, of uh, seeking legislative remedies. Uh, he's a young man who says that the only thing that white people understand is power, so we have to get power. In his mind, power is, uh, is pretty much tied up with fear. They have to fear us. They have to know that we are, we are to be reckoned with. 
So, you know, he, again, very much in concert with what else was going on elsewhere in the late 1960s, he refuses to disavow violence, as Martin Luther King uh, and his forces do. He's a young man who says that, you know, if I've got to break a window, if I've got to set a fire, if I've got to, you know, do something that drastic to get your attention, that's all on the table, that's all fair game. So he goes into, um, into, into Memphis, he, uh, you know, where his father is one of these sanitation men, and, uh, you know, they're at odds from the beginning, and then it gets worse when Martin Luther King comes to town. Uh, Dr. King comes to town and he leads what, ten what turns out to be the last march of his life. Uh, this march ends in, in, in a riot on Beale Street in Memphis. In my novel, one of the main actors of that, of that violence is my character Malcolm. And this has some really tragic consequences for him and his life, uh, but it also has this consequence. Late that night, as he is, um, you know, sort of the city is under curfew and, and, and parts of the city are still burning and the National Guard is, 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 is patrolling the street in with, uh, with uh, troop carriers, uh, Malcolm goes to work. He's uh, got a job as a janitor on the overnight shift at the uh, Holiday Inn. And uh, he goes to work and he walks out to take his 2 a.m. Bra break and there's this man standing there. And the man's about, this black man, about 5'7", five, 5'8", five, he's drinking a bourbon, smoking a cigarette. The man turns around and it's Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, whom, as I said, Malcolm has not had a whole lot of use for. Malcolm has scorned. And so they have this discussion, you know, Malcolm explaining why, you know, I don't feel like what you're, what you're talking about means anything, and Dr. King talking to him about the need to have patience and faith and play the long game, have the long view. And at the end of that discussion, Malcolm's got a lot to think about. At the end of that discussion, Malcolm feels that, okay, you know, maybe there's something here that I've missed. And uh, he is approaching Dr. King a week later when Dr. King returns to town to lead a march uh, to, you know, make up for the march that ended in violence, he is approaching Dr. King to tell him, what you told me really, you know, impacted me. It changed my life. I'm, I'm going to go back to school, and I'm going to, you know, nonviolent protest. I'm going I'm to I'm consider that. Maybe you've got a point. And he's walking to tell him this at 6 p.m. on the 4th of April on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. And as he's walking toward Dr. King, he sees something right over here across the street. Uh, a glint of sun sunlight off of something in a window. And he can't quite place what it is. And he's walking and he's looking and he's walking and in the instant that he knows what it is, in the very instant that he knows what it is, James Earl Ray pulls the trigger and Martin Luther King is dead in front of him. So for 40 years he's lived with two, with two pieces of guilt. One, that um, he saw it but he did not react in time. He saw that rifle poking out of that, the window of that flop house, but he did not react in time. Uh, and he did not save Martin Luther King, although he could have if he just, if he just reacted a half second sooner. The other thing he's lived with is this promise that he was gonna make to Dr. King. I'm gonna try it your way. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try what, you know, what you've proposed, what, 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 you know, what, you, what you suggest. So that's him in 1968. 40 years later, Malcolm has become a, uh, a nationally syndicated newspaper columnist. <laughs> Come on, get all your jokes out of your system. Let's go. Come on. I always tell people he has not become this nationally syndicated newspaper columnist. You know that there's a difference because he's got two Pulitzers. I've only got one. And he's driving a, he's driving a Corvette. I'm driving a 10-year-old Toyota, okay? So we are not the same except we do have the same sense of frustration. We do have the same sense that, you know, things have not come as far as fast, as far or as fast as they should have. So what happens with Malcolm is, uh, you know, on coming up on election eve, uh, he gets a, uh, one too many racist emails from one too many readers after having written, had to write one too many columns over one too many African American men uh, being shot senselessly, unarmed man being shot senselessly by police, and he gets a racist email in response, and he writes this very angry uh, burn the bridges uh, column, this America can go to hell column, uh, one of, near, near the lead, not quite the lead, but near the lead of the column, it says, I'm sick and tired of white folks' bullshit, and then he, and then he gets really blunt, okay? <laughs> he's just had it, he's just, he's just done. And he takes this column to his editor. Editor says, this is not going in the paper. Takes it up the chain of command all the way to the publisher. You know, they, they, they tell him, look, this is going to go in the paper the day after Sarah Palin weds Jeremiah Wright on a nude beach in Jamaica. So, you know, not going to happen, right? Malcolm, uh, you know, he goes to a bar and he sulks uh, and he drinks and he sulks and he drinks. And he has one of those ideas that seems like a really good idea when you've maybe had a few too many. You know, the hell with it. I actually know my editor's password. 
I could just go back there and put this in the paper. So that's what he does. He goes back to the office, you know, 11 o'clock at night. You know, everybody's gone. Presses haven't yet run. So he goes in. He goes to his public, to his boss's computer, signs on under his boss's name. And then he has another one of those bright ideas. You know, the hell with it. If I'm going to do this, in for a penny, in for a pound, I might as well put it on the front page. So it is that on election day of 2008, uh, this column that never should see the light of day anywhere is actually published on the front page of the uh, fictional Chicago Post newspaper. And then Malcolm disappears, and everybody's looking for him, and nobody knows that Malcolm has been uh, taken. He's been kidnapped by Clarence Pym and Dwayne McLarty. Uh, there are only two of them. Uh, they call themselves the White Resistance Army. There are only two of them, but they are the White Resistance Army. Okay, uh, Dwayne, is a, Dwayne is a jumpy little meth head with a, with a really violent streak. Uh, Clarence is this guy that you never quite know where he's coming from. He's 6'6", about 400 pounds, and he's, uh, he's this guy who's, um, you know, kind of following Dwayne, and you're never quite sure where he, where, where, he's, where he really stands in all of this. But they've kidnapped him, they've kidnapped Malcolm, and their plan is to, uh, to drive, a, drive him in a bomb. They've, they've turned a van into a bomb and drive it into Grant Park on election night to assassinate the incoming president, Barack Obama. So that's, that's how Malcolm's day goes to hell. One more character, and then I'll read you a little bit. Uh, Bob Carson. Bob is the other major character of the book. Bob is a, um, in, six, in 1968, he's this dentist's son, this middle-class white kid from Minneapolis. And Bob is a very earnest uh, young man. Everything that, that Malcolm doesn't believe about nonviolent direct action, Bob believes to his heart, okay? And Bob wants to know that he, as a young Christian kid, has the, the depth of commitment to do what he has seen his heroes doing on television. He's grown up watching the, the march in Birmingham and in St. Augustine and in Selma and in, um, in um, Albany, uh, Georgia, all these, all these demonstrations. And he wants to know that he has the, the, the depth of commitment to, uh, to put his body on the line for African-American freedom. So instead of going to Yale, where he's been accepted, instead of going to the University of Southern California, where he's been accepted, he goes to this little Bible college nobody's ever heard of in North Mississippi. And, uh, you know, as he says, he majors in English, but he minors in activism. And he becomes involved with a, with a campus group that is uh, trying to register African Americans to vote. But he also becomes involved with this young African American woman, and you're going to want to remember her name, Janika Lattimore. Jani yeah, all right, I heard somebody say that. Janika is his first love. Janika is that woman that you, fellas, maybe somebody can testify that woman that you meet that just sort of, you know, your brain, psh, you know what I'm saying? She's this woman who just, just sort of just, just blows his mind. He's just deep, you know, she, and she loves him as well, but they're just sort of deeply, you know, madly in love with each other in the way that you only really are when it's the first time and you're maybe 17, 18, 19 years old. Okay, so he and Janika are, you know, are in love and they're, and they're, and, and they're, you know, working for this, uh, this voting rights uh, campaign, but there's tensions in the relationship all along because, as I said, this is 1967-68 when everything is changing and things are becoming a lot angrier. And so there's, t there's tension in their relationship just along the line of black and white, along the line of things that perhaps, you know, she thinks Bob should understand that Bob actually has no way of understanding, okay? And it all comes to a head for them when they decide to go to a uh, march in um, Memphis that they've heard Martin Luther King is holding on behalf of the, uh, the uh, sanitation workers. As I've already mentioned, that march ends up in violence. Uh, in my fiction, uh, Ma Bob gets uh, set upon during that violence. They're running, trying to escape, and this black guy jumps on Bob for no other reason than that he's white and he's handy, and the black guy is, is angry, and it's, you know, it's a riot, so it's kind of what you do. Uh, and, uh, you know, so Bob is trying to do this nonviolent thing. You know, he's trying to cover up and protect himself and, and, and you know, and, 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 and reason with the guy. Janika, who is also a member of this nonviolent uh, uh, civil rights group, uh, sees this guy beating up on her man and takes a piece of masonry and clocks him upside the head. She puts her nonviolent aside for a moment, you know, and then they run and they escape back to campus. Uh, where, you know, it's already been a pretty hard day for Bob, and then it gets a whole lot worse when Janika tells him, you know what, for, for reasons that I'll, I'll read to you in a moment, I don't think we can be together anymore. 
you know, Bob, is, he's, he's just had, you know, the heck beaten out of him. And then this woman says, you know, I, I just don't think we can be together anymore. And he's lived with that heartbreak that broke his heart. And he's lived with that for a lot of years. Forty years later, Bob is uh, an editor at a Chicago newspaper, the Chicago Post. You hear it coming together? You hear it? Yeah, 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 see? See, we, we were going someplace all along, see? Bob is an editor at the Chicago Post, and he's up one, he's up one morning fixing his breakfast. This will give you a clue to Bob's personality as, as, a, as a man approaching 60 years old. Uh, he, uh, he spends every New Year's Day cleaning out his closet, Mr. Excitement, and the breakfast that he's fixing for himself is an egg whites spinach omelet. Okay, that's Bob. So Bob is up puttering around his kitchen very early fixing this egg white spinach omelet, and he gets a call from his immediate supervisor. Hey, Bob, you remember that column from our star columnist? <laughs> yeah, that, you, that we killed, we said was never, ever, ever, ever going to run in the paper? Yeah, I, I remember. Bob, it's in the paper. How would it get in the paper? Well, I don't know. Why are, you, why are you asking me? Look, I don't know, but the publisher wants to see you. We've got a meeting for 7 a.m., Young people in the audience, here's, here's, a, here's a business pro tip. If the boss calls you in at 7 a.m., just get your resume together, okay? <laughs> you ain't going to be working there too much longer, okay? So as Bob is dealing with that, you know, he, you know, he, he, and you got to understand this about Bob. You know, Bob is a guy, he, in, in 1968, he was this guy who was on fire for, for racial justice. In 2008, he's a guy who is, you know, experiencing what I call compassion fatigue, okay? His, his take with black people now is, okay, I understood, you know, what you were complaining about when there was a sign over here that said whites only or when there was a thing that you couldn't vote or when you couldn't get a drink of water here. But, you know, I don't understand this affirmative action stuff, you know, and I don't understand, you know, this uh, structural racism and mass incarceration and all this other stuff that you're telling me. Why should I feel any empathy or, 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 or sympathy there? Why don't you guys pull up your pants and, 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 and stop committing all the crimes? This is Bob in, in 2008. He's gotten a lot more cynical and a lot more angry. Part of it is because, you know, he's just gotten 40 years older. But the other part, part of Bob's problem with black people is that black woman. <laughs> okay. He's, he's, he's kind of had some issues ever since that woman, you know, kind of left him. So this is Bob, you know, that morning. And now he's got to deal with, you know, having gotten this, you know, gotten this phone call. And then he, well, then I guess I'll pick up from there with the, with the reading. Uh, so here we go. Bob stood and went about replacing the bags in the refrigerator, putting the skillet in the sink. There would be no breakfast this morning. As Bob was absorbing that minor disappointment, his telephone chirped again, this time the tone alerting him to the arrival of an email. Bob resented the slightly Pavlovian way the little device had trained him to pick it up at the ringing of a bell, to see some ad for erectile dysfunction, or a plea for help from a distressed Nigerian. For a brief moment, he thought of allowing the chirp to go unanswered. Didn't he have more important concerns? But in the end, he surrendered as he had known he would, picked up the phone, and clicked open his email. A name from your past, read the subject line. Bob opened it. What he saw put him back in the chair. Old friend, you cannot imagine my delight at running across your name while doing some research on the Post website. Well, not just your name. There are a million Bob Carsons in the world, after all, but also your picture. That's what sealed it for me. Even after all these years, I'd have known you anywhere. I have always regretted the way it was left between us, the things I said to you so long ago in all my youthful self-righteousness and ideological purity. I thought of you often and wondered what became of you. These past few months, I have been working in minority outreach for Senator Obama. I am on a plane right now and will land in Chicago at 10.30. I will be homeless for a few hours, unable to check into my room until this afternoon. I know this is criminally short notice, and I will understand if you can't do it. But if at all possible, might we have lunch today? I've missed you, Bob. I'd love to catch up with you. More than that, I'd simply love to see you again. Let me know. It was signed, Janika Lattimore. Janika Lattimore. He said it in a whisper, just to hear it being said. 
just to have the words on his tongue and the sound in his ear. All at once, Bob realized he had stopped breathing. He breathed. He was a trim and orderly man in wireframe glasses, pink scalp, peeking through the thin canopy of hair at the crown of his head. Once upon a time, back when his hair had fallen to below his shoulder blades, back when he was another man in another life, he had loved Janika Lattimore. Helplessly, that was how he had loved her, completely. And she had broken his heart. No, that wasn't quite right. She had not broken his heart. She had broken him. She had left him lying in pieces on a dirt road in Mississippi. And for the longest time, he had not known if or even cared if he could put himself together again. And even when he finally decided to get on with it, even when he did manage to put the pieces back together into something that vaguely resembled Robert Matthew Carson, it had never quite been the same. He felt like a piece of china glued back together by a sixth grader. The pieces didn't quite fit. The break still was visible. Bob had never loved again, never allowed himself to. There had been relationships, yes. He had even lived for a couple of years with a free-spirited painter in a crummy little apartment in Soho, and she had borne him a son he adored. But he had never married, much less immersed himself in a woman that way again. Now, he was 59 years old, and after all this time, here she was, blowing through town, blowing back into his life, and wanting to get together for lunch? Bob felt anger kindling in him at the nerve of her to show up 40 years later as an email in his inbox, blithely inviting him to catch up on old times, as if what had happened had never happened, as if she had not told him they had no future because he was white and she was not, as if he, with an ice pack to his head, and blood dripping off his chin, sitting in the back of that ambulance, had not begged her to stay, as if she had not turned away from him, literally turned away from him to be with her people. That was how she had put it in that self-consciously melodramatic way of college radicals of the 1960s for whom the revolution was a foregone conclusion, her people. I thought I was your people too, he had said, his voice wounded and confused as the ambulance door closed on him. He had always wondered if she heard him, and if she did, if she had answered. He didn't know. The door had closed like finality, and he had never seen nor heard from her again. Then his phone had chirped, and there she was inviting him to lunch. There was an absurdity to it that almost wrung a bitter laugh out of him, almost. Bob glanced at his watch. It was a few minutes after six. He needed to hurry if he was going to make the meeting. He pressed a button and the screen on his cell phone went dark. But it was an effort just to get up out of the chair. Janika Lattimore, he said, walking down the hallway toward his bedroom. So there's Bob's day going to hell as well. Um, we're going to have uh, questions and, 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 and answers in a moment, I believe. Uh, there's people with microphones stationed about, so if you guys just want to raise hands, and we'll point them to you, and we'll get that going. Uh, as I, you know, I'll just reiterate what I said coming in. This is a book about about irresolution. It's about the fact that, you know, I, I tend to believe, and I'm part of the generation that came of age in the, uh, immediately post civil rights. that came of age in the 1970s when we mistakenly thought that race and racism was something small enough and ridiculous enough to laugh at. You know, that by the time I came along, it had become Archie Bunker and all in the family and all, and all that kind of stuff. And we thought, okay, this is over. And the succeeding 40 years, pretty much 40 plus years now, pretty much the arc of my life have been a process of discovering how naive I was and how premature the celebration was. So this is a novel about, you know, where we come from and also where we go from, where we go from here. Uh, I tell people often, we talk about, well, you know, we, we, we were supposed to have ended up in, in post-racial America with the election of President Obama, and we find ourselves instead in the most racial America uh, since probably the 1960s themselves. So, you know, the question is, where are we? Where do we go from here? And, you know, what can we finally do to, to come to understand among us all that, you know, we, we've got one country, you know, we got one country, we got 
50 states, we got 320 million of us, and we need to find a way to live together in that country in, in, in peace. And until unless that happens, you know, we're going to be dealing with and having these discussions for the foreseeable future. Our grandchildren will be having these discussions until or unless we decide that we're serious about, uh, about doing something different than what we've done. So I'll leave it there, and if there's any questions. Uh, Mr. Pitts, yes. as a journalist yourself, mm -hmm. how would you assess today's media treatment of racial issues in the United States? How would I assess today's media treatment of racial issues in the United States? I tend to think that we are, uh, with, with a few sterling excep exceptions, very superficial in our treatment. Uh, and frankly, as, as people, forgetting media for a moment, our understanding of race in this country is exceedingly superficial. Uh, it, it, you know, people, you know, I used to say we need to have a, you know, I used to have, have that line, we, we, we need to have a discussion about race. That was one of my things. Now I think we need to have education about race because the fact of the matter is we do a lot of discussing about race, but most of us don't know what the heck we're talking about. You know, most of black, white, and otherwise, most of us don't, you know, have no real idea what we're talking about. We understand our lived experiences, but we don't really understand where the country has come from. We don't understand the, the, the forces that have made us. Uh, you know, so I, I think media, you know, media are one of many institutions that do just incredibly superficial job. Media, you know, people talk about media bias and they don't really understand. Media are not, media, the media's bias is toward what's bright and shiny and loud, okay? So media covering race is, oh my God, you know, Shirley Sherrod, did she say that or did she, did, didn't she say that? And then we'll spend a week obsessing on that or Paula Dean, or the frat boys on the bus or any of the rest of that stuff. And we'll, we'll spend a week, ooh, ooh, look at this, and we'll, you know, we'll have our arguments and we'll go back and forth. But we'll never or hardly ever have a discussion about race as race is lived. You know, as race is lived and how it impacts all of our lives on a daily basis, we, we'll hardly ever have that. We'll wait until a Trayvon Martin is shot or a, um, or a uh, Eric Garner is choked or something like that, and then, we, you know, then we'll do our thing and we'll, you know, par reporters will parachute into whatever the city is, and then they're gone. You know, so I, I, I don't have a whole lot of uh, respect for the way that we and others have, have approached race. Okay. Thank, you uh, right here, a question. thank you for being here. This I just kind of came here because I happen to be in Philadelphia. I'm not from Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So oh, this is a real treat. Um, but what made me, when you started talking, I mm -hmm. started thinking back to a book that I had read by mm -hmm. Harry Belafonte, who I'm a great fan. Mm -hmm. um, it's called My Song, and I don't know if you've read it. No. But, it, well, it was a, it was a real... You know, I lived through this. I lived through the 60s. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, in the northern 60s, not the southern. And I just thought he really kind of captured it. I wanted to get your opinion if you had read it. But no. he kind of went through that whole thing of the whole civil rights movement. And I'm like, how did I miss this? But um, I guess there was a question in here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I, um, haven't read, I haven't read Harry Belafonte's book. Uh, yeah, it was his biography, but mm -hmm. it, a lot part of it dealt with the, the civil rights, and it okay. was a real eye-opener for me from the northern white yeah, middle-class girl. Belafonte um, was a great bankroller of the, of the civil rights movement, which a lot of people don't, uh, don't know, and I don't know that he gets enough respect for that. Uh, yes, w what do you think of the writings of, uh, I'll try this, Todd Nahisi Coates? Todd Nahisi Coates? Do you think it's, uh, any of it is overblown, over-exaggerated? I think Todd Nahisi Coates is... Uh, story, his long cover story on reparations in the Atlantic was one of the more incredible magazine pieces I've ever read. I think his book, um, Between the World and Me, is very well written and makes some very trenchant points, particularly when he talks about um, white innocence, the phenomenon of white racial innocence, uh, which, as, as it happens, is also a point that James Baldwin makes in, um, in his book, The Fire Next Time. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, I, I, th where I part company with Tony Easy Coates is in what I perceive as his lack of optimism or his lack of, of feeling that you know Ameri that that we can redeem ourselves of this original sin of race. Um, you know, he someone told him that he was too not that he was not optimistic enough, and he said that they were too naive. Uh, you know, at least this is what I saw on Twitter. Uh, if that's the case, then I'll just be naive. Because here's here's the thing, you know, and I, I understand that people look at this period and say it's very bleak and how can you have optimism. But as bleak as this period is in a lot of ways, I would rather live in 2015 than in 1955, <laughs> you know. And if, if the people who lived in 1955 under conditions that I've only read about, okay, if they lived in 1955 and were able to rouse themselves to have enough 
op, enough faith in, their, in, the, in, in the ultimate humanity of their, fellow, of their fellow Americans and enough faith in their own ability to come together and do something, then I think, you know, how dare I, you know, in this, rel in this relative position of, of, you know, in this relatively decent position, relatively good position, how dare I sit up and say, oh, no, I, 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 I can't muster any optimism. You know, that doesn't that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So that's where I part company with him. But on most other things, I, I think we're you know pretty well even. I too uh, was involved in the '60s and the late '60s and early '70s, and at the Ohio State University campus, mm -hmm. we, were, we were going through a lot of what's happening in America today with African American students and white students even having their own dances at the Ohio yeah. Union and not being with each other. My question is this: What are your thoughts on the college campuses? Not just since the University of Missouri protests but over the last four or five years where they have been attacked for being politically correct by not allowing different points of view from being on their campuses and shutting down opinions. Uh, when you look at the free speech movement of the mm -hmm. 1960s, it was all about ideas and allowing all points of view to be heard. That's why the protests happened. And now we have students today and faculty members mm -hmm. who are trying to deny different points of view from theirs. Your thoughts? To tell you the God's honest truth, I've been hearing uh, a lot about that. I have not looked into it for myself, so I'm a little hesitant to, to, to make an argument, but based on what, on, on what I have been hearing, which is along the lines of what you've been saying, uh, you know, assuming that is the case, uh, it's rather uh, appalling <laughs> to tell you the God's honest truth. Uh, college campus should be a place for a, for a free flow of ideas, including ideas that we find repugnant. Uh, I was a student at the University of Southern California when William Shockley uh, came to speak. And Shockley, for those of you who don't know, is a guy who promulgated the, um, the theory that uh, uh, African Americans were congenitally uh, inferior to whites. And there was a I remember there was a big fight on campus over whether or not he should speak. And I said, he should let him speak. You know, a lot, let him speak. I, I, believe, I believe in the free market of ideas. And I believe that if my ideas are better than yours, then that's all that's needed. So if you, if you want to espouse whatever it is you want to espouse, short of, of promoting violence, you know, short of promoting violence against me or somebody else. But other than that, if you, whatever the idea is that you want to promote, I, I think that you know, the First Amendment requires me to, to allow that. And this whole idea, I'm, I'm really troubled. And again, I'm, I'm speaking on things I've only s looked at secondhand, so I'm not totally sure. But, I'm really troubled by this idea that I keep hearing that we have to protect students from, you know, certain I certain ideas or certain, you know, bad, you know, things because this is going to create a, you know, hostile environment for them. I, I just don't know where we where we get this idea that young people are hothouse flowers, you know, who need to be who need to be, you know, protected from that kind of thing. Um, you know, I remember there were a few years ago there was um, a movement uh, they were going to censor. They they did censor, I think. Uh, um, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. Uh, they took out the N word and they took out references to Injun Joe, uh, and I consider that an act of vandalism, <laughs> you know, against one of the two or three you know great American novels of all time. Uh, but you know, so I, I really have an issue with this whole idea that we have to censor the world for the sensibilities of uh, of of our of our children. I think that we need to to give them the tools to understand the world. I think that I think you could a lot uh, go a lot further with that. There's a lady right here who had a question. Hi, um, Hi. I'm Tanya. Um, I'm here on the English assignment. You need to put that mic up. I'm here on the English assignment. With yeah, I saw class. a bunch of people writing, taking and notes and stuff. Uh, yeah. I was trying um, not to get offended. I'm like, well, they ain't, ain't paying attention. Yeah, we need to remember what uh -huh. you said. So yeah. um, anyway, my question. Um, I I did want to say that. Um, mm -hmm. When the riots of 68 and everything was going on, I was just a little girl too young to understand, mm -hmm. but I can really remember mm -hmm. um, the violence that took place during that time. But I was just curious to know, what do you, um, what do you think um, we could do as a whole to, um, about making um, things better as far as racism is concerned? You know, I've, I've been getting that question a lot lately, and I actually appreciate the question. but. Here's the thing, and it sort of it sort of backtracks to something that I said a moment ago, and it, you know it doesn't sound like a sexy thing. I think so. I think people t typically going to resist it, but I <coughs> excuse me. I think there needs to be some education. I think because I'll put it to you like this: a guy tweeted me about three four months ago. I don't know why you black people are complaining or why you haven't done better. You've been free since 1865. Okay. So, so now I've got to explain the whole history of Jim Crow, lynch law, yada, 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 
in 140 characters or less, <laughs> you know, to this individual. But this is the this is the the state of a lot of people's understanding, you know. And 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 let me emphasize: this is not accidental. This we are ignorant, and the ignorance is not accidental. This ignorance was was imposed because the ignorance is a lot easier than facing the hard questions of American history. Okay, gets back to this gentleman's question when we were talking a moment ago about Mark Twain. Well, why do we, you know, why is the N word in there? Because that's what they used, you know, on a pretty common and consistent basis in 1860 uh, or in, in the 18 in the 1860s. So this whole idea of you know of of of, of whitewashing or, or of, of wrapping our history in, 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 in some sort of, you know, cotton to, to take away the rough edges, you know, it's been going on for a while. It's, you know, you heard about the state of Texas a few months ago, issue, it had the textbooks uh, describing uh, the early African American residents of that state as, uh, that state as uh, immigrants and workers. The state of Virginia did that 20 years ago only, it called them settlers. The state of Arizona has outlawed ethnic studies classes, okay, oh yeah. The state of Colorado, students recently, uh, well, about a year or two ago, I guess it was, walked out of classes because the school board in Jefferson County had issued a, um, a, a policy that only quote-unquote positive aspects of American history could be taught, okay? So we are, we are witnessing the vandalizing of our history. And there's a couple of problems with that. One, if, if you don't know your story, I can tell you any old thing <laughs> And you have to, and you, okay, that must be it. Two, as and look at these young people here, you know, for them trying to understand, you know, how things are and how things got to be the way they are without somebody giving them some background is like me trying to walk into a movie an hour, an hour in and trying to figure out what's the plot. Why is he shooting him? Why are they kissing? I thought that she, she was with this other guy. Wait a minute, why are they chasing this guy? You know, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to understand the movie if I haven't seen the beginning. For our young people too often, black and white, they have not seen the beginning and nobody's told them the story because we find it difficult, we find it painful. You know, it indicts us as white Americans to say, okay, these things were done in the name of whiteness. It indicts us or hurts us as African Americans to say, look at, look at what we were subjected to. But I am, I've reached a point where I'm totally impatient with people's hurt feelings <laughs> and tender feelings because this stuff needs to be known. And the longer we leave our children in ignorance, black and white and otherwise, the longer we leave them in ignorance, the worse we make the situation. So that's where I start with, you know, I, I believe most people are good, you know, want to be good at heart. You know, Anne Frank said that, and I've, I've always felt that to be true. But if, let's say you're white, and you can look at African Americans, and you say, that, you know, here's the pathologies of, you know, uh, you know poverty and, and joblessness or educational gap or whatever, and you can look at that and say, well, you know, I don't, they're, they're as equal as I am. They go through 7-Eleven and through the front door just the same as I do. Why, why aren't they doing any better? Because you don't know anything about, you see what I'm saying? Then you have no basis from which, on, on, upon which to really understand what you're seeing in front of your eyes. And as African Americans, the same thing. Well, I guess we just must be second class. We just must be unable to do any better because this is what I see as an African American. No, no, go back and look. Go back and understand you know, the theft of, 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 of your of property, of money, of bodies, you know, and then you have a better framework from which to sort of understand where we are in this world and where we need to go. Thanks for being here and all your great work. Um, what are your views on Ben Carson and the <laughs> views he represents? I'm sorry, I was busy laughing. I didn't hear the rest of that. Ben Carson and what? The views he represents. Okay. Somebody always wants to wind me up in these things. I don't know why it is. We're standing here. We're having a nice, peaceful whatever. I think Ben Carson is an idiot, okay? Let's just say that. Uh, and I think that he doesn't often get, get called out as such because, unlike Donald Trump, he is a quiet, reasonable-sounding idiot, okay? But he is no less an idiot. And my antipathy for him, you know, dates, frankly, you know, even before the presidential campaign when he was only thinking about running, uh, ben Carson lost me forever the day that he stood and said that the Affordable Care Act told a, a predominantly white audience of conservatives the Affordable Care Act is worse than slavery. And in fact, it is slavery. Okay, now let me, I am used to Republican candidates and potentates and whatever saying stupid things, particularly about the African American experience. But for an African American man to stand in that place and say that God awful thing, Ben Carson lost me forever. 
you know, he lost me, he lost me for good and forever because that was, that was profoundly insulting and appalling. So, you know, I've got, I've got real issues with Ben Carson, <laughs> I guess as you can tell. Um, you know, I've got, I've got issues with, you know, I mean, and then, you know, pile onto that all the other stupid stuff he said. You know, if the Jews had guns, it could have been a Holocaust. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, uh, I would not want to see a Muslim as, pre you know, all the other stuff he said just piles onto it. But for me, it started there because that told me what kind of man he was, and I was, I was deeply offended. I'm really glad I came tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to thank you about your point about Huckleberry Finn followed by a question. Um, Huckleberry Finn was the last book my mother read to me before I insisted on reading for myself. I was six. And um, she used it to teach me about racism in America and how Jim was treated as less than a man mm -hmm. and, and why we don't use certain words because she used the context to teach me how words were hurtful. Mm -hmm. So if you take those words out of there, you don't, you lose the lesson. Yeah. And so I was really, I was really moved to hear you say that tonight because every time I hear people talk about taking that book away, it's like taking something really important away from us, I think. Yeah, and I think we also spare young, because one of the complaints okay. they had or one of the rationales they had was that, you know, young people, you know, are hurt by it and don't have, don't have the context to understand it. I think we take away from them the ability to try to understand it. Why was this word used in this context? Now, okay, young people, you use it in every third rap song, okay? Kanye West, if he can't find something else to rhyme with trigger, you know where he's going, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right? So I'm a little skeptical of your hurt feelings in the first place. In the second place, you know, why, you know, why was this word used in this way in this book? You know, and, and what did it mean as opposed to the way that you hear it, that, you, that you're hearing it used, you know, today? I think there's all sorts of lessons there. Uh, but again, it gets down to, to teaching and challenging kids and not sort of bubble wrapping them and sending them out into the world, you know, to protect their, you know, their, their precious esteem or whatever. My, uh, my question is, was there I'm a sorry, did I, did I start babbling before you even got no, to your question? No, I loved, I loved your answer. My just, bad. Go is on. there a book like that in your, in your youth or your childhood that, um, that was, um, made an impression for you in terms of your own identity formation or your own awareness? <laughs> the earliest books to have any impact on me, uh, you know, and you say you, you were read Huck Finn when you were six. I was like Marvel Comics at that age and Beverly Cleary, you know, and, and that stuff. So... I don't know if there's any one of those, you know, that really did the trick. Uh, the first book that I can remember reading, you know, I wasn't a child. The first book that I can remember reading that really profoundly impacted me was, um, was uh, Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. I think the ending of that book is just uh, one of the most incredible experiences in, 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 in American literature. Uh, and, you know, it, it's very, it's exceedingly powerful. So it probably would be that book. Thanks. Leonard, I hope this isn't deflating given what it seems the room wants to talk about, but I mm -hmm. just want to ask a straight novelist technique question. Cool, a I writing was, question. Yeah, I, I was amazed at, as you were laying it all out mm -hmm. how complicated, y it sounds like you really were walking a, almost a, kind of a high wire. I mean, you mm -hmm. had these two very different stories mm -hmm. over time, and like comets, you had them connect. Mm -hmm. Could you just give us a sense of, uh, it sounds like you took a risk there and yet you pulled it off a and when you brought it together it was wonderful to listen to the stu two stories come together but it was like an amazingly risky thing to do. Could you, could you just give you us mean a as sense? A, you mean in terms of the writing? Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it, it, I don't I don't know that it was so difficult in terms of the writing because when you, when you, you know, when you write a novel, you give, you know, or you, when you read a novel, you know, as a, as a as a writer, you've got a certain amount of golden time from that reader, you know, in which, okay, they're, they're going to let you run and, and see if you hook them, if you've got anything of interest. So I think that every, you know, putting together that complicated story within that golden time, for me, it's about 100 pages in if I decide whether or not I'm going to finish this book or not. Uh, I, I don't think that that was really a, a, a difficulty. What's difficult for me, actually, is talking about the book in, in, in this setting. Because unlike the two previous novels, the two previous novels were, I guess, more high concept. If you asked me to describe Freeman, I could do it in 25 words or less. You know, a former slave goes searching for his, uh, for his uh, ex-wife whom he hasn't seen in 15 years at the end of the Civil War, you know. Uh, but Grant Park resists that. You know, Grant Park, as you say, is a very complex narrative. And I, and I felt that if you don't get both sides of it, then you're missing something. 
you know, but in terms of the writing itself, no, there wasn't really a whole lot of difficulty in, term, in, 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 in dovetailing. As a matter of fact, by the second chapter, you already know that, um, that you know, that Malcolm and Bob are, are intertwined, you know, professionally. And then I think a couple of chapters later than that, you start getting the 1968 component. So it wasn't really, you know, I didn't feel, really feel risky doing it in terms of the writing. I just want to piggyback off the uh, importance of education because we learned so much about where the interstate um, highway project started from. Mm -hmm. So I think like education is, being educated is really um, a good factor to know about a lot of things. I'll just put it to you like this. I think that um, in terms of education, if you leave your education only to the schools, and this is not, this is not a slam to schools, but if you leave your education only to the schools in terms of what's going on, what has gone on, then you're gonna miss a lot. I did not become a, a student of history until after I left college. I mean, yeah, actually college, high school and college. And I got A's in history, but I didn't feel any particular connection to it or any particular understanding of it. You know, and, and they were teaching me, you know, what was the date of the Smoot-Hawley tariff, you know? And, you know, I, <laughs> to this day, I don't, I don't remember anything about the Smoot-Hawley tariff, you know, or what, it was, what, it was so imp what was so important about it. But I didn't become interested in history until I got out of school and started reading, um, I read old newspapers. You know, and then you start reading and say, oh, this is fascinating stuff. And then you start understanding, okay, this is not just names and dates and, you know, some obscure legislation. This is my life. This is all the stuff that led to me. This is why my daddy was that way. And this is what my mama was talking about that time when she said such and such. So I think, I think that if you really want to understand the world and your place in it and how things came to be, then you really have to, have to take responsibility for your own education because otherwise it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. We got one more back here. Hi. Hi, I taught U.S. history at the college level for 40 years. I'm sorry, years. I apologize for everything so, I just uh, said. <laughs> so I wanted to go back actually to a really important comment you made about these, co these communities uh -huh. turning back, saying no, you're not gonna teach that. No, mm -hmm. we're not gonna have that. And I think it's a useful reminder that that means that we did try to introduce these ideas about the diversity of our experience, about slavery, about what African Americans have gone through, about what Latinos have gone through. We have been trying to introduce this into the schools for the last 40 years. I've been through some of these battles. And there mm. is a huge resistance to it. Yeah. And so it's not just we need to have education, because if you look at all the curricular initiatives that have been gone through, if you look at any college level history textbook these days, it is dealing with many more of the things that you're talking about. Yeah. It's what I've been teaching for 40 years. My students read Ann Moody. They read, you know, Confessions of Natural, and they read a variety of things to get that sense. College classrooms are reading Huckleberry Finn. And yet people are coming out of college and consciously rejecting that lesson. Because it's difficult. I know it, but I'm it's just saying it's, it, we can't just say yeah. we need more education. Yeah. We need some cultural, you know, something has to happen for people to embrace what their college professors are teaching them. You know, that's, in, that's an interesting point. Um, I don't recall, you know, I don't recall that that was an issue 40 years ago. I don't recall that, when, you know, when Roots came out, because my, my personal theory is that a lot of times, as I said, for African Americans, you look at, you look at a lot of these aspects of history, and there's a shame. I understand that you know Jews also at one point uh, I've heard you know felt some sense of shame and this is the reason they don't want to discuss their experience in the Holocaust and I think if you're white there's a sense of you know misplaced communal guilt you know look at look at all this stuff that was done but I don't think that but I don't well here's what I don't understand that didn't seem to be an issue in the 1970s black and white we all sat down and watched Roots and it was painful Okay, I'll never forget the day after the first episode of Roots aired, I, I had a, a white friend of mine, Dave Whitesell, we worked at the um, University of Southern California bookstore, and you know, me and Dave were always goofing around, we're both like 19 years old, we're always both, both goofing around, having a good time at work. I go into work that day, and all the black folks, frankly, were all were steaming, and like a little bit upset, and like, you know, little attitude problems, and Dave, like most of the other white folks, just stayed out of our way. <laughs> You know, so it was difficult. It was very difficult. But I remember also at the end of that day, Dave came to me, you know, with this, with this apology, with this, okay, I, I understand something I didn't understand before. You know, so that stuff is important, but I think we just don't want to go through the hard stuff. You know, and I don't know where that's come from, because again, it wasn't there in the 1970s. We had a lot more, it seems to me, we had a lot more courage, you know, all the way around to deal with these aspects of our history in the 1970s. And ever since then, we've decided this is stuff that we can't talk about. And it's not, you're right, it's not just history classes. It's if you go to the, um, 
Civil War battle sites, you know, you'll find very little discussion of why the war was fought. If you look at the studies that they or the, the polls that they're doing now, I think up to 53 percent, it's 41 percent of Americans, I believe, and 53 percent of uh, white Americans in the South. Slavery didn't have anything to do with the Civil War. You know, so it's like it's just it's, it's real. Yeah, it's really amazing watching our history, you know, e be erased. And I just don't think we can stand still and allow it to happen. And I think that's my last. And yeah, they're going to come get the hook for me. So thank you very much. <laughs>